Hey, hey, hey! <laughs> For this another live stream. My name is Jesus Castillo from rubyguides.com. So today uh, we can start talking about some code reading and projects because reading code is one of the ways that we got from open source from open source projects we are going to be reading and changing the title reading ruby code from open source projects how about that hey hello hey uh, how's your project doing and um, you commented in another um video that you you were inspired to build some project from the NASA API um, live stream. Did you get started with that? Okay, so we have uh, rubygems.org and this is where you can find projects to work on. I mean, projects to read, to read the code. And you go to RubyGems ORG releases. And these new releases for all gems. And here you can see recent gems that were um, released. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, how many downloads they have and all of that, but you can also look at popular gems. That means gems that have lots of downloads. As you can see here, we are talking into the millions of downloads. So that will be things like Aspect, and Active Support, which is part of Rails, Active Record, of course, also part of Rails, in Faraday, which is an HTTP client for which you can use to work with an API. So I pick, uh, we can start with Aspect because Aspect is pretty popular. And we can see how, a little bit about how it works. So this code reading is very useful and very helpful when you uh, you want to learn more about Ruby. It's one of the ways that you can learn Ruby. So there are a few ways that you can do that. You can either, you can um, read books, you can watch videos, you can read articles, but you can also read code. And if you combine different ways of learning, I think you can learn um, more effectively, effectively or better. Okay, we have Damo Daran M. Hey Castillo, who are you? Good. Who about you? So, how do you get started reading reading some code? That's a good question. Well, there are different um, ways to do this. Uh, that depends on your goal. If you just want to learn something new, then we are going to look for some file that looks interesting. If you want to learn how to jam um, works in general, I probably start from like the jam spec to see the dependencies. So we can see what other things Aspect is doing in our needs. And we can look at other top level files, like the readme, things like that, specs for the, see how Aspect itself is tested. That could be interesting. And uh, really here, we can see a few things that, that are interesting to look at. 
So for example, we can see this. So here we check in if Ruby version is 1.9, less than 1.9. Why? Because and on other versions of Ruby, Ruby gems was not required automatically. Right now, Ruby gems is integrated in Ruby, so it's required automatically for you. But for other versions, I guess we're still keeping this. And the learning that you can get from that, other than that information, which is interesting, is that you can get the Ruby version using this constant. So this is a constant, and we know it's a constant because it starts with a capital letter. It doesn't have to be all capital characters for it to be a constant. So for example, aspect itself is a constant, it is a constant. And you see, we have the RS in capital letters, but PEC is in lowercase letters, but it's still a constant, right? So there is that. Then we have another require. And here we have a global variable. Usually we try to avoid these global variables, but we have here one in here. And you can tell it's a global variable because it has this dollar sign in front of the variable name. And it seems uh, it's trying to assign this configuration object to this. Okay, so next we have a few more things that are interesting. Um, this class, you will see this notation with colon, colon, then another constant, colon, colon. What does this colon, colon mean? Do you know that? Well, if you don't, that's okay. That's why you're learning. You're always learning. I think that you should always be learning. There is no back to school. You're always learning if if you want to make progress and, and grow, right? You're always learning. You're always at the school, even if that school is online or even if that school you create it yourself. You create your own curriculum and your own content by doing things like this. You pick a project, uh, read it, um, take a particular file like this one, and we just break it down. We see, okay, do you understand what this particular line does? And not only the line in general, but every single part of this line. So you understand what this is. Okay, yes, this is a constant, right? And what's the value of this constant? Well, it's going to be some kind of float because you are converting it to F, which means to float. And you can actually open a terminal and see Ruby version and see what this looks like. Oh, it's a string, right? But if we do to F, we get this. So now we get more understanding what's going on. And this line has multiple things. Oh no, this line. So the colon colon uh, is like we are accessing into another constant from this constant, right? So it's, um, this is called like namespacing. Uh, namespacing is like one thing, it's like a box that has things inside, like a box. So our spec in this case contains core and core contains configuration. So that's basically what this means. 
And the colon colon is a way to access a syntax. It's a way to tell Ruby, okay, I want the constant core from aspect. And uh, from that, I want another constant called configuration. And these constants are probably classes or modules, modules themselves. Uh, GitHub now has this feature, as you see, as I ha it highlights and I can click on these things. So maybe I can, yes, it tells this the definition, see? It is telling, okay, it's defined here. And now if I click on core, it says it's present on 106 files. Wow, that's a lot. So that probably means this core uh, is pretty important, or at least it's very involved. And the definition for the configuration is in right here. This is the definition, right? And uh, RSpec itself is defined in all of these files. So we learned that and when you are satisfied that you understand what's, what's happening here, you can go into the next line. So next line, it's a method and we can look at the method as a whole just to see what's going on. We see it's a method called new. I see far inside this class configuration it also happens to have the word self in front of the, of the new. What does this mean? This means we are defining a class method. Okay, we're defining a class method. If you don't know what that is, I have other videos and articles that explain that. Okay, so we have a class method called new defined on the configuration class. Next, we have some arguments, some parameters. Okay, and these are uh, these asterisk arcs, these arcs, or A-R-G-S, and the, then we have ampersand block, ampersand block. So each of these things have some kind of meaning. What's, what's asterisk arcs? If you don't know that, that's fine. You can find out. Actually, um, the asterisk has different meanings in in Ruby, depending on where it is, depending on the context. And the ampersand has a specific meaning. So, what is the asterisk? The asterisk. And I can make this a little bigger. The asterisk. In this case, it means variable arguments. So we can take any number of arguments when we have this. So that means we can pass um, no arguments or we can pass a string, uh, string or two strings or two strings and an integer or two strings, an integer, an array and a hash. So you can pass any numbers of arguments and they will be safe inside an array with this name. So in this case, with the name of arcs. Okay. Uh, what's this? What's the ampersand? Well, the ampersand makes this capture the block. So basically, when we call when we call this new method, we can pass a block to it. And the block we have, we can access the block with the name block as just like a normal variable. It becomes a proc object. So in another video, I talk about procs, if you want to learn more about that. Okay, so that's a lot and that's just a few lines of code, right? But once you start seeing this, you see patterns and different ways to that these things are done. 
I will have some comments on chat. I work in a Ruby on Rails, yeah, great, me too. Where, how much experience Chennai do to get you? Yeah, I'm in Chennai. Yeah, just some conversation happening in the live stream chat, that's good. So next, we have this inner piece of the method, the body of the, of the method. And we have this super, again, another thing that you might not be familiar with, or maybe you are. Either way, you want to understand this when you're doing this code reading technique. So super equals up to the super class. So that means there is an, uh, a super class which by default, if there are no other, it's called object. Object is like the default super class. And from object, it goes to basic object. And then we have a method that we call on whatever super is. This method is called tap. Uh, how do you find out what method to? what a method does, well, you go to the Ruby documentation. That's one way to do it. And you can also, of course, search Google, search any resources that you might have available to find out what it does. We can also see that this that method takes a block. So the block starts here with the do, and then uh, it ends with this end. Uh, we have a config. We have a config parameter here. Then we have some comments. Um, we are using this config right here. So you can see config. And it's setting that to deprecation stream equals S T T out. What's this? Well, first of all, we can see it's a global variable. But it's, it's not any global variable. It's a variable that has some, that comes as part of Ruby's, has some utility. Uh, specifically, this means standard out standard out. So std means standard, out means output. So this is basically the, what you see, the output of the program, the results of the program, that's the standard output. The opposite of that is standard input. Standard input is what you write. Standard output is what you get back, what you see, what the program will display. So that's standard out, std out, standard out. So that's this, and um, we can move on into the next section. So this section is, starts here and it ends here. Seems this is another block. Uh, this uh, map method with this block. Uh, this argument is called file, and we have this dir, dir um, class. So again, this part of Ruby itself. So this is a class which has documentation. She so means it has some examples has a description, a definition of what it does. But basically what we're doing here is we're looking for Ruby files. So that RB, that's Ruby files inside some spec support directory or folder, if you prefer. Okay. 
And then what we're going to do is we're going to go over this list of Ruby files. And we're going to do something with them. What? We don't know yet. We have to read the, the rest of the code, which is just two lines. This and this. So here uh, it says if the file uh, does probably strings, if the file name, I think that's what that is, or the file path uh, includes this word, fake clips, then we skip, we skip this, we go next. Uh, after that, um, okay. We require the file, so this is regular Ruby require. And uh, before we require it, we do some GSOP. So GSOP stands for, um, for global substitution, global substitution and what are we substituting or what we we are replacing well we're replacing uh, this string spec support which is here too by support do you see that you're replacing this by this and then after that happens we require that file. So that's done. Of course, you can go faster if you want. Just look for, you scroll through the, the files and just find something that gets your attention and see, okay, that's interesting. What's this? Or what's that, right? That's another thing you can do. Instead of going this slowly, um, every single line you can, okay, okay, what's this begin and sure? What's this and sure? I haven't seen it before, for example. And then you can explore, you can investigate what that means. Then we have this instance variable set. So we're setting some instances. Interesting that this and uh, this are the same. And they relative path rejects, relative path rejects. Hmm. I wonder why it's done this way because I don't think you need this line of code. The whole point of unsure, as I understand this, is that this, we, this line of code will always be run, uh, whether or not we have, uh, oh, I think, no, mm, mm, this is not going to raise an exception, most likely. If something is going to raise an exception, it's going to be this yield. Right? So I don't think this is required here. We don't need this line of code probably, but maybe they leave it behind for some reason. If they are testing uh, our spec itself and they have a test for this, I will probably try deleting this line because in source so run this Always, this basically always run this line as far as I understand. So what's the point of running the same line twice, right? It just adds confusion. Why is this line twice in here? It's the same. First you waste time seeing, is it the same line or not? I don't know. All right, we check, it seems to be the same line, right? In fact, we can to copy and find, and of course, that confirms, but it's in the, the same line. 
exact same characters. So why is it here twice? Right? You spend some time just wasting your time trying to figure that out. And then you see, okay, there is this unsure. Which basically means I always run this. Then why do we have that? Out of that thinking time can be safe is in fact is if in fact it's possible to delete this line without um, affecting anything else. Oh maybe you know what's probably happening here is that whatever is going to yield, I don't know very well the uh, purpose of this um, method, but whatever is going to yield probably needs this variable to be nil for some reason. Maybe that's why this is here twice. Hmm. This one of these rare occasions where if we, we need, in fact, we need to have this twice, maybe I will add a little comment explaining why. Why do we need the, this to be nil? Maybe you could explain, okay, we have this code twice because um, the code we are yielding to expects relative path rejects this to be nil. Okay, that might be helpful if there is no way we can remove this duplication. Right? What do you think? I'm open to um, your own ideas. Okay, so I'm like all examples, this is really helpful. Yeah, you're welcome. With a before hook. Um, what before hook? There are no before hooks in plain Ruby. Before well, yes, they are. They are hooks, but no, I don't know if they are like before yield. I don't think so. Uh, the hooks that we have in plain Ruby before else is like included. There is one called included, and that's when you're including a module into a class, then it triggers that hook. Um, there is an, a few more in the same fashion, but I don't think there is one like before that explicitly called before something. These are, that's a real thing, like before action. Okay, we have that done. Next, uh, we see aspect configure. So here's a new thing. And I don't think, I don't understand, when, I don't understand what all of these things have to do with each other, right? Because we see, okay, it's pet helper, but how is this relate to this? Why is this all of this code together on the same file? That's one thing I'm, I'm looking at right now. Why is the, all of this code in the same file? What's the purpose of it? Hmm. Okay, we can take a look here. We can see that this configured is present in four files. Uh, it seems to be different versions. So we have this configuration options, this runner, this for matter support. 
and this seems different because notice they have different parameters. So config are out, right? This same kind of different. Anyway, this seems like some default values, right? So we are including stuff, we are setting color to true, we're raising errors for deprecations, we're including aspect helpers, which is on one file here. Oh, wow, that's quite the name. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I don't have a problem with names that are this long, but this name um, with safe level to, it's kind of hard to, for me to pronounce and to say and to, and what's the difference between this one and this one? Seems to be the same one again. Yeah, same one. Why? Maybe because this it works differently. Oh, we have some explanation, I guess. So that's got that. Um, still not. Oh, yes. Safe level was remo removed. We are removing these safe levels in, in newer rural versions. But still, um, uh, I'm not a big fan of how this reads. Again, if you need a long name, have a long name. That's fine, but it has to read nicely and has to have some meaning. Maybe I would call this with security errors or yeah, or with mm. anyway, we also have these ignoring warnings from here. Uh, I'm seeing this lack of um, lack of consistent consistency. So here we are using this pattern with, which I've had seen before, with this, and then we call yield, right? So this is, this ignoring warnings. It's the same thing, right? We are doing something before and after and we yield, but this doesn't follow the same, um, the same pattern of the width. So it should be called like width, uh, warnings disabled, right? Something like that, with warnings disabled, if you're going to follow this. this pattern. Okay, so let's go back to here where we were before. So it's, yeah, it seems like it is setting up some, uh, yeah, some defaults for our spec. Okay, see? Here is the pattern again with EMV bars. As I said, you start seeing patterns in the code, not only on the code itself, but on other projects, you will see these patterns. I define here and the disk with EMV bars. It's the same pattern. We save the 
the before, we call yield, and we set the after. So what's going on in here, we call env.hash. Then bars, which is what we are passing into, we set the environment to whatever it's defined on bars. So we're changing the environment. And when, then we do whatever we have to do, that's the yield. And we make sure that whatever happens at the end, so even if still raises an exception, we're going to replace the whole thing, the whole environment variables with the original environment variables, which we have here. So again, it's the same pattern, the width, and we can also see a without here which is interesting. And the difference is that here we are deleting, we are deleting everything basically, all of these environment variables. And then we replace them, the original. Yeah, th this is where we were before with this. Okay, um, what else we have here interesting? Oh, another constant, Ruby engine. Oh no, this aspect itself, not aspect testing, fine. We are looking at aspect core. It allows you to add plugins, uh, factory bot, for example spec folder um, um maybe i don't know what line of code what is that and here we have another thing um uh, this is a regular expression you know it's a regular expression why because we have forward slash forward slash right here, right? That makes it a regular expression. And then inside the regular expression, you can use variables with string interpolation there. We can use this version variable. Uh, that's fine. By the way, if you are new here, uh, my name is Jesus Castellon. Uh, I write uh, for the website rubyguides.com. In there you will find my newsletter and my Ruby book, which can help you improve your Ruby skills. Also, we have a few more things in here. What's this? Another regular expression, because we have forward slash, forward slash. See that? Um, that might look very complicated, but you can break this down. All of this is looking for is for this. So something like this, then a space, then whatever. So um, that, something like that. And then, because there are these parentheses, this is called a group, um, grouping in, in regular expression. This is a group. And when we have a group, basically what we're doing is, in fact, we can try this regular expression. What we're doing is we are extracting whatever this is. Ta da! There it goes. If I change whatever this is, uh, I put some numbers in there. There. But if for some reason this doesn't look like that, it looks like this, then we get empty because it doesn't match this pattern. 
So that's what that is. Even if it looks kind of funny, has a purpose and it has meaning that you can understand. So there is that. Ah, oh, this is also interesting that we can go to new. So this um, this was added um, recently to GitHub and it really helps with code navigation because you can see, okay, this was defined here and I can click and I can see all of the files where this is defined. Can see even where it's being used. So that's ultra helpful. So any questions about this? Or Ruby code read, reading, um, anything like that. Use a seed file when testing? And um, that's a good question. Uh, the, uh, yes, well, you need some, some data. So there are a few ways to do it. Uh, one is to use seeds. Another that I also like is called fixtures. Fixtures. So it's called fixtures. You can actually use this. In fact, the whole purpose of this is to create data that you can use for your test. So, and this integrated in Rails. So if you're testing a Rails application, you can use this and it's integrated. It comes by default. So you need to install any gems or do any special things or anything to make this work, it just comes built in. So that's a big advantage, right? So that's called fixtures. Okay, so using fixtures in test cases. So here you have most of what you need to know. If you go to the documentation for fixtures. Of course, this is an older version, but I'm sure that you can find newer versions too. For the same thing. Um, This about the same. My fee is still valid from the other page. Yeah, yeah, still is the page. So you can use this or you can use seeds if you want. Uh, it's pretty clear that you need some form of data um, to, do, to do your testing. So this works. Uh, another thing for features is that you can actually 
import your fixtures as database into your database. So you can do, use that as sample data, just like seeds. So seeds are more used more like sample data, but fixtures can also be used, imported into the database. So you can use them as sample data, as well as for testing. So hope that helps. Fixtures equals factory, but no, 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 there are different, different things and different, different ideas, although they have the same goal, but they are not the same thing. That's a good question. So, um, Risa can uh, ask, on a broader, le broader level, is it a choice between fixtures, factory bot seats, or do you have to use all three for different situations? That's a great question. Th thanks for asking. Um, I will pick one and go with it, mostly. I will definitely not mix fixtures with factory bot because they are very much in the same, in the same, they're solving the same problem. Uh, also factory bot is a gem that you have to install. Fixtures are built in to Rails. So if you have to add a gem, every time you add a gem, you're adding some load, some heaviness to your application. So if you can avoid adding a gem, that's good. And seeds, you could use seeds if you need some, for some reason, you need some extra data that you can't provide uh, with the fixtures. But I think really uh, just pick one of the three methods and go with it. That's probably your best option. We have BD Bijani from the live stream chat. Uh, she's saying, hi, I have to write a script in Ruby for web scrapping. Please help how I do it. And you will need something called Noko Giri. Noko Giri. So this is basically what you need. And uh, you will need to be familiar with CSS selectors. Um, that's pretty much it. There is a, I have a small tutorial on my website on rubyguides.com, but you can also try this examples right here. Basically, what, what you're trying to do with web scrapping is two steps. I, I cover it uh, in another live stream. It's two steps. One, you want to get the HTML data from the web server, and then you want to parse it, which means you are extracting meaning out of that data, out of the HTML. And Nokogiri does that for you. It helps very much find the title, find the different tags, like the paragraph, paragraphs, or the images, or the links, or whatever you need from the site. Also check if you're allowed to do the scrapping on the website. There are many websites like Amazon that don't like web scrapping very much because they are taking their um, their information. They might have an API. If the website has an API, that's a much better way to access information. But if you use web scrapping, make sure that uh, you're in the clear to do that. The, they might 
automatically um, ban your, like your IP address from accessing the website if they detect web scrapping and it's not allowed. So you should know that. But to do it, what you, the most thing that you need is not query, it's a Ruby gem. Thank you, yeah, you're, you're welcome. I have a video too. It's an older video on Nukugiri on my channel. But it explains how it works. So that's Nukugiri for web scrapping. Uh, any other questions before we end this session for today? And by the way, if you want to find me when I go online, I will have a specific schedule, but we will be around this time of the day if I go live. Uh, but if you want, and if you don't want to miss some videos, make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet and enable notifications. So the way to enable notifications is to press the bell, little bell button next to the subscribe button. I have a long question. Um, okay, what kind of question is it? Maybe it would be better if you email me that and send me details. If you have a code or screenshots or anything to go with it, you can. Oh, respect mocking. Okay. I have, have you seen my video mocking? Mocking or giving it a value. Okay. For giving it a value, you, you're looking for some kind something called uh, a stop, right? Stop, it is like a can response, right? Can response. Um, for the mock, uh, you basically check in if the method was called, was this method called um, n number of times. That's basically what you're doing. And you can do both with aspect. But you want to limit this only to when it's really necessary. I find that I most of the time I don't have to do this either. Because if there is a gem called um, BCR, uh, to, this we take care of. Uh, everything for you when you need of most of your needs of mocking and stopping of these two. So this is a Ruby gem, BCR. Where you have more specific um, question about that, you can email me and we see if I can get back to you. No warranties because I get if an uh, emails and I can always reply all of the emails. But yeah, check this out. Check this PCR jam, which I think is could be very helpful for you depending on the details of what you're trying to do. Stats PCR jam. jam. And here's my tutorial. I have a tutorial on my website. If you want to see how it works.
Okie dokie, so I'm done for today. Uh, thanks a lot for watching. Again, if you want to keep learning, make sure to subscribe to the channel, enable notifications. Yes, yes, that's a cat, yes. <laughs> uh, you are correct. Um, enable notifications um, and visit my website, rubyguides.com, rubyguides.com. In there, you can subscribe to my newsletter and get a copy of my Ruby book, which is called Ruby Deep Life. Thanks a lot for watching. I will see you in the next video.